Uh, and the, the title of the message is Daring to Plant in Faith. Um, we're going through this sermon, uh, this Daring Faith uh, sermon series, and uh, you know, it's it's one of these things that the the it's a we like to use sort of uh, visual language or, or sort of metaphors to help describe our our faith a lot of the times. And I love the idea of anytime we we use agriculture as a um, as a you know a metaphor for our faith. I think it works really well, especially in Iowa. When I was in college, I went to a, I went to college with a kid that was from. Um, he was from Brooklyn, New York, uh, and when we, I would, you know, he, he loved the fact that I was from Iowa, and we had a pretty good relationship, and uh, he didn't understand anything at all about crops, and so when I, when I would talk to him about, you know, detasseling corn or something like that during the summer, his, his face just glazed over, because he didn't have any idea what I was talking about, uh, and it's, it's so interesting that, you know, you think about all the language in the Bible that has to do with... Um, planting and harvesting and sowing and reaping and, and this, the language of, of crops growing and the, the, you know, the mustard seed turning into the, the big plant. Uh, the, and you realize that for, for people to live in really heavily urban environments, they don't have the same connection to it that we do. So I, I feel really fortunate that we have this, uh, this idea that or the, the, you know, we're from Iowa. It, it's, uh, it winds up being a really... Um, sort of meaningful set of metaphors. Um, in, uh, in Rick's, uh, this, this uh, well, I'm sorry. So this, this, uh, sermon, this sermon this morning is titled Daring to Plant in Faith. Uh, and the, the idea is we're, every day we're planting things. The question is just what are we planting? Um, and, and so I wanted to talk to you about some of these points in here. Uh, point number one in the sermon is that everything starts as a seed. Um, when we are uh, going through life, we're constantly planting seeds in, in our relationships, in the way that we work in uh, our, you know, in our churches, in our families, at, at uh, work, wherever we are, everything starts as a seed. So what you're you're harvesting now it was a seed that was planted long ago. And, and, you know, maybe it was a seed that was planted yesterday. Maybe it was a seed that was planted when you were a child. And things are constantly growing and we're constantly harvesting. But everything starts as a seed. And so uh, anything that's valuable, and then this metaphor for the seed, anything that's of value is something that you are, um, you're planting. Those are seeds. So whether it's a kind word to someone, whether it's hard work on a project that you're doing at work, whether it's uh, schoolwork, whether it's whatever it is, you're planting seeds. And um, <clears throat> so the, the question is, what kind of seeds are you planting? And this is, I mean, this is, this is the point of a, of a sermon in itself. What kind of seeds are you planting as you're going through your day? Because that's going to determine what your harvest looks like. Right? So if you're planting seeds of um, compassion in other pe- with other people, if you're planting seeds of generosity, if you're planting seeds of hard work, those things are going to come back to you. Um, if you're planting seeds of, uh, I don't know, talking bad about your friends, Sam, you talking bad about your friends, uh, then, uh, then you're going you're gonna to harvest that back, Right? Uh, if you're if you're harvest or if you're planting seeds of laziness, then you don't expect to harvest uh, the 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 harvest that would come with hard work. So this morning you have to you have to ask yourself what kind of seeds are you planting in your life. Point number two of this message is that nothing happens until seeds are planted. You know. Uh, a lot of times, people, and, and uh, I don't know if I'm getting old or what, but uh, it seems as though uh, as you, know, you interact with younger people, and I'm sure that I'm absolutely positive that people used to say the exact same thing about me. So don't take this as me saying that you know, it wasn't me in the same position when I was young. It seems like when you're young, you don't have the perspective that 
if I want something, I have to work hard for it, right? Uh, a lot of times, young people, uh, I'm trying not to have develop this in my, my own children, uh, have the expectation that, oh, well, life is easy and things should just be given to me, right? Uh, that's not the case. We, life takes a lot of hard work. Um, and the, the reality is you can't expect to harvest anything until you start planting seeds. And so you have to ask yourself, what do I want to harvest? And what do I need to do to start planting those seeds now? Um, if you want to harvest a, uh, well, if you want to harvest a capital campaign where we raise a bunch of money, you don't just wake up one day and say, hey, we're in the middle of a capital campaign for our church to raise money to buy a building that we can turn around and do some really awesome stuff in the community with. You say, okay, I want to have a harvest three years from now. Actually, three and a half years from now, because we technically we didn't start. We were working for six months in planning prior to even launching the capital campaign. I want to have a harvest in three years, so I need to start planting seeds today. And, and that's one of the things that we've been doing, and one of the things that we're right in the middle of. We, we have this... Um, <clears throat> you know, we have this idea that we're going to uh, do a bunch of work at the outset and then, you know, magically there's going to be some harvest moving forward. And that's not the case, right? We're right in the middle of the sort of dog days of uh, our capital campaign where, we're, uh, you know, it just seems like I'm, I'm constantly talking to you, everybody about money. Um, but in reality, you know, last month we raised just over $6,000. The total, oh, let me grab my bulletin. The total that we've raised to date, this counts as our update, in case anybody uh, is keeping, keeping score. The total given to date is $167,199. Now, we have, a, we have a pretty lofty goal of over $500,000. If we don't raise one more penny than we have raised today, we've raised $168,000 above and beyond the tithe, uh, our, our regular tithes and offerings for the, the work of the kingdom over the last almost two years. That's unbelievable. I mean, now, this morning is not indicative of the, the, the entire size of our church, but everybody look around. This is, this is who we are. We're, we're a church <clears throat> that is, when you, you look statistically at the other churches in the United States, we're sort of on the larger size because there are a, a, a ton of really small churches. But we're not a big church. We're, we're a healthy church. I love our church. Uh, but we're not huge. And we've, we've raised almost $170,000 over the course of the last, you know, uh, well, not even two years. That's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to do that unless we started planting seeds. And we, we started planting seeds a long time ago. And so the question is then, what, what kind of harvest do you want in your life? What kind of harvest do you need? And what kind of seeds are you planting? Do you need a different job? Well, then you start planting those seeds. Start getting the experience that you need to be able to get the kind of job that you want. <clears throat> do you, you know, do you, do you need a, uh, oh, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, and let, let me, let me, um, let me start by telling you a little bit about my own journey. Uh, so I grew up in, and some of you have heard this before, some of you probably have not. You know, I'm from Iowa. I grew up in Ames, just up the road. Both of my folks work for Iowa State University. They're great people, if you haven't met Jeff and Heidi. Um, they, uh, they both work in the engineering college at Iowa State. And I decided, my brother's an engineer, so there's, we have sort of uh, nerds in my family. They're great. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't cut out for that. I didn't, wasn't good enough at math for engineering. Uh, and I felt a call to ministry. So I attended Southern Nazarene University, one of our schools here that's affiliated with the Church of the Nazarene, and studied theology and philosophy. 
And while I was there, I met my wonderful wife who stole Stephen's wonderful wife, and now they're out running through the rain this morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, was educated. Uh, and then after that, I graduated, went to Nazarene Theological Seminary, where I received my seminary degree, a master's divinity degree from NTS, and um, worked for the, the Pensions and Benefits Division for the Church of the Nazarene, um, where I helped people you know, families work through the death benefit process when they're, you know, when a, a minister or his spouse would die, um, what the, the death benefits would look like for, for those, for our, our clergy. Um, and I didn't have any idea. I just thought it was a job that I had during seminary, and I didn't realize how important that would be later on. Um, graduated from seminary, went on, uh, took a position in Florida. Now, my experience in life had been on Interstate 35. Ames is on Interstate 35. Oklahoma City is on Interstate 35. Kansas City is on Interstate 35. Miami, Florida is not on Interstate 35. Uh, it is a very different environment than, uh, than the rest of the, you know, the, than the rest of my experiences. And, uh, you know, we went down there. I, I was the uh, youth pastor for the church. I was the, ch the church ran a private high school. that had about 500 students. I was the chaplain for the junior and senior high for the high school. And then I taught ninth and 10th grade biblical literature with no experience teaching. And let me tell you, it was, uh, it was a learning experience way more for me than it was for them. Uh, but after, after a couple of years, we decided that, you know, and we had Walker about the same time, and <clears throat> we decided that it just wasn't the right environment for us. And so we uh, made the decision to move back to, to Des Moines, and it was, I took on the position of the administrator for the um, Iowa District Church of the Nazarene, um, working with the district superintendent. And uh, during that time, I went to law school. I felt God leading me in a different direction and attended Drake University's law school. And... Uh, you know, it, it is, you look to see, you look at your life and you realize that as you're planting these seeds, the harvest that you have, uh, the, you know, the seeds that I was planting all along were preparing me for the harvest that I'm going through now. And the, the, the seeds that I'm planting now are preparing for the harvest that's going to happen in the future. It's this sort of cyclical process that we all are familiar with, you know, you my uncle always used to say, you pray in the winter, you plant in the spring, you work in the summer, and you harvest in the fall, and then you just start all over again. And that's the, that's the, the sort of rhythm of life. Um, and as, we, uh, as I've been going through this, I wouldn't have been able to do the things that I've done had I not studied, you know, basically logic in college. It's really prepared me for the practice of law. Um, the, my, my interaction and my... my um, my work with people and their the troubles in their lives in ministry has really prepared me for my sort of the professional career that I have uh, right now because I, I'm I'm just interacting with people and helping them address some, some of the major areas of their their need in their lives and, and as we've been as I've been going through this journey of my life I really do recognize that um, had I not planted seeds years ago. I would not have. I have not. Would not have been able to have the harvest that I've had to now. Now, it's not saying I've had some sort of enormous harvest. Everybody thinks of harvest and they just think of finances. That's not a, the case at all. The harvest is everything in your life. It's your experiences. And without without the, that planting, I wouldn't have been able to have the experiences that I've had. Um, the third point of this sermon is uh, when I have a need. I should plant a seed. You like that? It's alliteration. When I have a need, I should plant a seed. I feel like I should be on television saying that. Uh, um, a lot of times, people, and I see this, I see this all the time in life or in my in my career. They wait until things are there is a desperate need before they take action to meet that need. Where if they would have planned earlier, then they wouldn't have been in the position that they are, they're in. So when you recognize that there's a need, don't wait until the need becomes an emergency. When you, ha when you have a need, you plant the seed. Um, <clears throat> 
the so one of the things that I do in my practice is I do I work a lot with uh, um, the aging population as they're preparing for long-term care. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, a family member has one person in that's going to remain in. We, um, this is sort of indelicate, but you know, one one the the person that's moving into long-term care, we refer to them as the institutional spouse because they're in a one kind of long-term care facility or another. Um, and then the, the other spouse is the community spouse. They're remaining in the community. And so um, one of the things that we do is we say, okay, well, what can we do to effectively plan to make sure that the person that's going to be staying in the community is able to not have to eat rice and beans every night. They're, they have money to buy things. While the other person uh, is, has their care paid for one way or another uh, in their long-term care, because long-term care is incredibly expensive. Long-term care is, you know, depending on where you're at, is anywhere between five and seven thousand dollars a month usually, uh, in in the state of Iowa. And so, the people that come to me, like I'm helping a family right now, that it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty complicated plan that they have. Um, but we're going to wind up, we're going to wind up preserving the majority of the assets. Not, and they're not, they're not, you know, millionaires or anything. But they're, they've got, they've been working their whole lives to develop uh, their retirement. And now we're going to be able to save that to make sure that the spouse is able to, you know, live their live a life that's comfortable while the the other spouse remains in long term care. <clears throat> but all the time I see people come in. Oh, you know my you know whoever it was. We've known that this person has had you know Alzheimer's or dementia for years and years, and we now they need to go into a long term care facility. We haven't done any planning. What can we do? And it's really difficult when you don't plan ahead. And so this sort of planning is super duper important. Um, and it's important to do it as soon as you recognize that there's a need. Uh, and a lot of times what people will do, and this is, uh, I think, a really interesting point that he makes in, in this material, is when a lot of times we're tempted as Christians is just to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. Uh, and God absolutely wants us to pray about it. But if all we do is pray then we're missing the other half of it because God doesn't just expect our prayer. He expects our work too, right? If you want to accomplish something, you don't just pray for it. You also work for it. You, you have to do that. It, they, these things go hand in hand. So planting isn't just praying. Planting is getting out and getting your, your hands dirty. So when you have something in your life, when you recognize that there's a need in your life, you have to plant that seed. And the planting of the seed isn't just putting it in God's hands or something. Planting the seed is getting your hands dirty, getting my hands dirty when there's, when there's a need. We already touched about the fourth point a, little, a minute ago. The, uh, this point, as it's, as it's in here, is whatever I plant is what I'll reap. Now, I think there's a sort of a fundamental truth to this that everybody basically understands. And that, and that is, you know, it's the, it's the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. Or, uh, as I like to say, uh, don't be a jerk. Uh, if you're a jerk to other people, other people will be a jerk to you, right? Don't, don't be rude. If you're rude, to, how many of you have been in traffic and somebody has done something rude to you in traffic and your immediate reaction is, if I had a gun, I would shoot the tires out. Uh, is, it, is that just me? Um, the, uh, it's the truth, though. If you do things that, if, if you plant seeds that are bitter seeds, you're going to have a bitter harvest. And, and so one of the things that I really like about Scripture is uh, you can tell what's important to the author's Scripture by how often they talk about it. Because there are certain things that, like, there, and this happens in, with everybody. Like, there are certain things that I think are super important that are mentioned in Scripture, like, twice. And it's like, well, maybe it's not as important as I think it is. Because if it were, maybe they'd talk a little bit more about it. And then there are things that are, like, uh, doing well for the disenfranchised, taking care of the people that can't take care of themselves. Uh, that's in Scripture over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's the whole I mean, it's, it's practically one of the major tenets of Scripture is that, hey, there's no more powerful or less powerful. There's just everybody. Uh, 
and we're all in this together. And that's, you know, a, a very different this part of what scripture was fighting against is this idea that there's this hierarchy of some people are better than other people. And God says, everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome to my table. Well, this is one of those things that it's, it, the scripture talks about over and over again. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 says, you're going to reap exactly what you plant. Job 4, 8 says, people who plant trouble harvest it. Uh, Proverbs 22, 8 says, whoever sows sin reaps weeds. Um, in the New Living Translation, that same verse says, those who plant seeds of injustice will harvest disaster. Uh, Hosea 10, 13 says, if you plant wickedness, you will reap evil. Matthew 7, 2, Jesus' words say, whatever measure you use to judge others will be, measured, uh, will me uh, will be used to measure uh, how you are judged. You're going to sow what you reap. Or you're, I mean, yeah, you're going to reap what you, uh, what you sow. Now, there are also positive examples of this, which are super-duper important. So like Proverbs 11.8 says, the one who sows righteousness will reap a sure reward. Hosea 10.12 says, plant, seed, plant good seeds of righteousness and you'll harvest a crop of my love. And James 3.18 says, peacemakers plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. So this is that same question. What are you planting in your life? What are you planting with your kids? What are you planting, what are you planting with your spouse? When you get frustrated with your spouse, you're going to have a conversation with him or her. That conversation will be a seed. What kind of seed are you going to plant during that conversation? It's difficult because what you plant during that conversation, uh, and I'm not, she's not here so I can pick on her. Uh, my wife is awesome. My wife has the greatest memory in the history of wives uh, because she will remember something I said from when we were dating uh, the, that was a long time ago. And uh, when we will be talking about something offhand, she, oh, you remember when you said this, that back then? Well, I guess you changed your tune now. And it's like, well, I guess I have. <laughs> That's what age and experience and wisdom will do. Uh, but it's the same thing. You know, when you have these interactions with people, with your coworkers, with anybody, what, what are you going to, you're going to reap what you sow. And so the question that you have to ask yourself is, what do I expect this harvest to look like with this person that I'm interacting with? Because, so I, we had one of the people that, had, so uh, the second half of my story is, I graduated from law school and started a law firm uh, with two of my classmates. Um, it's really interesting, you don't really know people until you get into like working with them every day and uh, learn very quickly that these are not the people that I thought they were. This is this is going. This might be difficult for me to talk about. So if I, you know, if I get too, uh, uh, if it seems disjointed. It's because I've never really talked about this with anybody besides my spouse before. Um, you know, so we get into practicing law together, and it becomes evident pretty clearly that we've got very different values, right? Uh, my career is an extension of my ministry, which is just an extension of my life and my relationship with, my, with, with God, with my family, with everything else. And so uh, I practice in areas that are meant to help other people. Um, and and I, I, don't, I, don't try, I try not to fault the people that I work with, but they had just very different motivations. Their motivation was to earn as much money as they could, however they're going to earn it, so that way they can do what they want to do to accomplish their next goal. And their, um, you know, their practices were predatory. They were predatory towards the people that they were um, working uh, against in cases, which, uh, you know, zealous representation, especially if there's going to be an antagonistic, you know, issue that you're working with, you know, you, you work for your clients. But in a very real way, it was also predatory against their own clients because the more trouble that their case was, the higher the legal fees were going to be. And so you have to, you have to balance this idea of, well, you, I can accomplish this for a relatively low amount of work and as such a relatively low amount of income for me, or I, could, I can help make this a real mess and I'm going to profit from it. And, you know, it takes a little bit of time to be able to see these patterns develop in people. And so you, uh, you know, the, the, 
the this recognition winds up happening, and I made a you know a commitment pretty well, maybe maybe eight months ago, I made the decision that it was not going to be a long term proposition for me to work in that environment. But one of the things that I wanted to do while I was doing it was ensure that the people that I worked with, that I really cared about, had the, you know, were, were taken, care of, taken care of. Because as, a, as somebody that owns a business, it's not just me. It's not like I just go to work every day. I got people that I'm paying their bills. They've got kids and stuff that I'm, you know, the, the health of this organization is the thing that's helping them survive in life. And so it's a real, real responsibility. And it was, you know, in some ways, really the, the responsibility that I've, I've been most surprised by. As a as a as an attorney is, you know, this idea that the business that I'm building doesn't just impact me; it impacts other people that are working for me. Um, and there's this uh, there's a guy that I was working with, very good guy, uh, and he and I worked with him. Uh, uh, he was he was a law student at the time, and uh, he. Uh, he had a pretty traumatic event that happened in his life. He had a wound up, thankfully, just being not, it was not a tumor, but he had a, something that was in his sinuses that was causing him all kinds of problems. And he, he wound up having a, uh, have to have a major surgery to, to remove this, uh, I think it was a cyst or something like that, but non, it was non you know, tumorish. Uh, not, not something that was going to kill him. It certainly made his life pretty difficult, but it wasn't going to kill him. But during this time, you know, I made I made it a point to say, okay, what do I need to do to take care of this person? Um, and during that uh, that time in his life, you know, I sort of went above and beyond, and he started asking some pretty deep questions because when you have when you hear the, this, uh, the doctor tell you we need to do surgery up inside your head to remove something that we don't know what it is, he gets super freaked out. And he didn't have a whole lot of experience with the church and with faith and things like that before. And so he started asking some really, really deep questions about life, about my perspective on things, because he knew my background. Um, and since then, I, obviously his, his life has improved greatly. He's um, gone on he's, uh, to sort of do other things. And um, obviously his, everything went fine with his surgery and everything like that. But and he and I still have a really good relationship. I had I not sown those seeds of making it a concerted effort to be good to those people, uh, I would not have been able to have the harvest of these really deep, meaningful conversations with with this person um, that have led him to a place of faith. That that he, uh, I well, I didn't lead him to a place of faith. That God, you know, the the Spirit, sort of me and a bunch of other people that were consistent presences in his life were just honored to be a part of that process. But uh, without doing that, uh, without planting those seeds, I wouldn't have been able to have that harvest. Whatever we plant, we reap. Now, the fifth point of this is that you're not the only sower. There are people all around you all the time that are sowing seeds. You're sowing seeds in the life of other people, and other people are sowing seeds in your life. And not just other people that are sowing seeds in your life right now. People have been sowing seeds in your life before you were ever born. And that's one of the things that we need to, we need to understand about life, is that there's a lot of stuff that happens in our lives that there's no way for us to have any control over whatsoever. Whether it's genetic, whether it's uh, the, the family history that you have that's come up behind you, that's put you in the place that you're at now. Um, like my whole family is from the East Coast. My, both of my grandparents uh, were from, one was from Virginia, one was from West Virginia. They went to school up in Boston. Um, and just by chance, they happened to move to Iowa because the USDA wanted to start an animal disease lab in Ames. And the only reason that I'm in Iowa and not in Maryland or somewhere like that is because of something that happened a long time ago. But now I couldn't imagine not being from Iowa. That, that harvest of 
the relationships that I've had in this context are because of seeds that were planted way before I was born, way before my parents were born. The, seed, the, the, the life that you lead is impacted by seeds that were planted by people hundreds of years ago in some cases. That creates a tremendous amount of responsibility on all of us because that means that the seeds that we're planting today, they're going to not only impact me and you, they're going to impact our kids. And they're going to impact our kids' kids. So what kind, of, what kind of harvest do you want your grandkids to have? And if you've been sowing seeds that you don't want them to have that harvest, guess what? Plant new seeds. Start today. Plant new seeds. It's sort of piggybacks on the, on the next point of this is you always sow in a different season than you har- or you always, you always reap the harvest in a different season than you sow. Don't expect to sow the seeds today and get the harvest tomorrow. Plant seeds with the understanding that this is a harvest that's going to come in the future. You can't wait to plant the seeds until you have the need, like we said a minute ago, because it's going to come in a different season. The longer you wait, the longer the harvest is going to be. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 has this famous, and is made famous not only by the Bible, but by uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity in, under heaven. A time to plant, and a time to harvest. A time to scatter, and a time to gather. There really is this sort of cycle to this idea of planting and harvesting, is that we have an obligation to the harvest. But in order to meet that obligation, we have to plant now. Don't wait until you have a need to start planting. Uh, the seventh point is uh, planting is hard work. Growing things is hard work. You have to be patient and not give up because there are going to be times where you don't see anything happening in your life, in your relationships, in the, in the, the you know, you have this idea of what you want to accomplish there's going to be a lot of time and a lot of what seems like fruitless seasons between now and the harvest. Be patient. Don't give up. It's a... Well, point number eight is that uh, I always reap more than I sow. Now, uh, how many of you have ever actually farmed? When you farm, well, I, let me pull it back. How many of you have ever had a garden of any kind? Right? Has, has every seed that you've planted in the ground resulted in a plant? Of course not. You, you scatter as much seed as you can in as thoughtful a way as possible with the hope that those seeds will result in a, uh, you know, a yield. But even though every seed doesn't result in something to be harvested, the harvest is greater than, you know, the, the, uh, than what you, you could expect, be given sort of the, how tenuous life can be, especially as you're planting. Uh, as you're going through life, you, you'll scatter seeds, and you're going to reap more than you sow. If you, if you sow generosity, you're going to be amazed by how much more generosity you'll experience. Not just, we talk about generosity financially usually. That's the, 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 basically the last thing that I'm talking about when I talk about generosity. Really, generosity is a mindset, and it's a, it's a spirit that you have about you. Having a generous spirit is the best thing that you can do because it impacts every relationship that you have. Because it's basically like, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt when I'm interacting with you. I'm going to be generous with how I'm, you know, interacting with whoever it is, whether it's my spouse, whether it's the the guy working at the the uh, the little ticket place as I'm pulling out of the parking garage, trying to take my money, and for some reason the the card reader won't work. I can I can get frustrated because I've been sitting in line for 20 minutes and take it out on that person, even though it's not his fault. 
Or I can have a good attitude and be generous with that person. And be like, oh, you know, was, these days happen, don't they? Well, it's the, when, when you have that generous spirit, you're going to receive generosity back to you. If you sow that sort of crankiness or bitterness or whatever it is, you're going to get that back. And it's likely going to be worse. Uh, <laughs> So how do you increase your harvest? This is point number nine. How do you increase your harvest? You increase your harvest by planting more seeds. So the question is, what do you want? What kind of, seed, what kind of harvest do you want? What kind of seeds do I need to plant? Then how do I get the best harvest that I can? Guess what? The answer is, plant as many seeds as you can. And the nice thing about our life and this metaphor is, there's no limit to the amount of seeds that we have. Depending on, depending on what you want, if what you want is kindness, there's no limit to the amount of kindness that you can. Yeah, kindness is awesome. It's great. And there's no, there's no limit to the amount of kindness that you can provide to other people. If you want a life where, uh, where you're harvesting um, joy, then give joy away. Uh, if you want a life where you're a billionaire, then give billions of dollars away. Right? I guess that's how the logic works on that one. Um, good luck, by the way. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting because some of the, and especially when we're talking about Christianity and, and generosity and things like that, you know, it's this idea that uh, we, we somehow believe that uh, God blesses us because we're followers of God in ways that he doesn't bless non-followers of God. And uh, Jesus himself said it, the, the God brings rain to the righteous and unrighteous alike. This is a principle that doesn't just apply to, to believers. This is a principle that applies to everybody. The, and, and, you know, I always, I always just look at people as, I don't look at uh, them as this us versus them I think that's a really bad way to look at people. People are way more complicated than just you're either on Team A or you're either on the Packers or the Cowboys. Uh, and that's not the way that it is. It's just we're people going through life. Some of the most generous people I've ever interacted with are non-believers right now. Some of the most tight-fisted, un like. And not just not just in financially, but just just in in life and the way they interact with people, are have been going to church for fifty years. They're they're the least charitable people I know, and their whole life is built around the church. Uh, so you have to this idea that we're going to be uh, that you're going to uh, plant more seeds that. Uh, that that's going to wind up bringing back this harvest. B, uh, you know, you're going to provide those to, uh, to believers and non-believers alike, and God's going to give us a harvest based on that. The more seeds I plant, the more God will give me. This is, the, uh, this is amazing. This is, this is the, the, the reality of the situation. The more I plant, the more God will give me to plant, right? If I want to sow kindness, but I feel like I don't have any kindness to give today, God's going to give you that kindness. God's going to give it to you because God wants that. God wants us to have this idea of, um, uh, God wants us to have the, um, the seeds to be able to plant and harvest these things the virtues in life. Second Corinthians chapter nine verses ten or chapter nine verse ten says, uh, "For God, who supplies seed to the farmer and bread to the bread to eat, will give you more and more seed to plant, and will make it grow, so that you can give away more and more fruit from your harvest." God doesn't give us the seeds that we plant in order to harvest and hoard. Right, God. We have this idea of accumulation. Accumulation is something that happens when we look at other people as us versus them. Right, 
we're all in this life together. If we, if, like, uh, so my brother just went to, uh, we went to China for three weeks. Uh, he's an engineer, he was working on, going to um, do some, work at a plant that they're, I mean, he's, they're basically shipping his job over there. He's coming, he's expecting to come back to his own pink slip, but uh, he went to China for three weeks and he stayed in a hotel, but several nights he went with his host family that was there, the one family that spoke English. Husband was an engineer, wife was a lawyer, uh, one young child, two, I think I believe it was his parents that lived with them in their two bedroom apartment that was uh, basically falling apart. Um, they, these are people that should be successful, sort of middle class, upper middle class people, right? They don't have, I mean, they, they have more than a lot of other people that they interact with, but not, they don't have a, a ton. He goes to the plant manager's house, and the plant, plant manager lives in basically a mansion and drives a Volvo that in the U.S. would probably be worth 80000 They would probably pay like $80,000 for this new, very, very nice Volvo. There it would probably cost $160,000 of U.S. dollars. These people, the, the wealthy, have a tremendous amount of money, and nobody else has anything. And there's this enormous gap. Uh, this idea of harving, uh, harvesting as much as we can in order to collect it and keep it to ourselves while everybody else can figure it out for themselves is not a scriptural idea. But it's a very tempting idea in our culture because we're, we sort of value ourselves by our by our our own ability to harvest and generate for ourselves. Um, God says, that's not what I'm doing with, with, your, um, with, with the seeds that I'm giving you to plant and it will turn around and yield a harvest. What I'm giving you is uh, seeds to plant so that you can harvest and then take that harvest and make sure that everybody's getting something to eat because I've done that for all you people anyway because it's all coming from me one way or the other. Uh, the more seeds we plant, the more God will give us. But the more God gives us, the more he expects us to give that stuff away. The, the 11th point of this sermon is that uh, I plant by faith and not by my feelings. How I feel doesn't matter. What God has done is God has given us a command to go and do, to, to, to plant, to sow these seeds and there are days where I wake up in the morning, I don't want to do anything. Uh, I certainly don't want uh, to, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that the kids are up and out the door and that uh, I'm getting the, like the, the work that I have to do gets done so that way I can keep the lights on and all that stuff. I don't have any energy left at the end of the day to plant seeds for anything else. But that doesn't matter. How I feel about it doesn't matter. There's work to be done, and so we do it because we have faith that God's going to, to provide us this harvest. Uh, there are days where we're going to be discouraged. There, we've been planting seeds in the lives of our friends and family. We don't see that the yield from that. We don't see the harvest from that taking place. It's discouraging. Doesn't matter. Keep planting. Keep planting, keep planting, right? The, you know, the old saying, the old Nike saying is just do it, right? Well, it's the way that it is. We just do it because even though it doesn't feel like we're going to yield a tr tremendous harvest all the time, we have faith that it'll happen. And finally, the best time to plant is now. Do you have something that you want to have happen? Start now. Do it now. Start planting those seeds right now. Do you want to, let's look at something that is not, doesn't have anything to do with our faith at all. You want to go on a cool vacation? Start thinking about it now. Is it going to cost $5,000 to take your family on this cool vacation? You're not going to be able to do it next week. You can do it five years from now. You create that, that memory for your family five years from now. Start working now to yield the harvest 
that you want to have in the future. Over a year ago, we started this process of the capital campaign. We're not there yet. But if you want to, if you want to yield a harvest of hundreds of thousands of dollars in the future, you start now. That's what we did, and we're in the middle of this. Uh, about eight months ago in my own life, I recognized that the, the, the environment that I was in wasn't going to be the right environment for me long term. Uh, and rather than allowing it to get to a place to where I recognized that it was just going to break and that I was going to leave, and business is so weird and it's so different than anything that I interacted with before, uh, especially owning a business. It's, it's, uh, it's awful in a lot of ways. Uh, it's great in some other ways. Um, I don't know, my, my boss is as big of a jerk as I want him to be that day. Um, but the, I made the decision that it wasn't going to be the right thing. And so I started planting seeds to be able to make that positive change uh, that I needed to have for my own life. Uh, and I, I started planting those seeds. And then it, uh, as things progressed uh, until about August 1st of this year is when I made that transition, um, that's when that, uh, I began the harvest of these seeds that I planted eight months ago, that I was able to transition in a way that was effective, that provided for the people that I wanted to make sure were provided for at my old position. I was able to open doors. Um, one, of my, one of my staff people is going to wind up signing on with me here within the next couple of weeks. It's going to be great. Um, things, are, things are great. Everything that I'm yielding the harvest that I, I started planting months and months ago. It has been a tremendous amount of work. It has been uh, late nights and early mornings and difficulty and stress and what little hair I had, the rest of it's fallen out. Um, but I, I am beginning to see that. And, and so from a personal standpoint, I can tell you this is the truth. If you want to ye have a harvest yielded in your life, start now, and you will see that you will see that harvest by planting now. This forward and faith journey that we're on uh, is much more than just a capital campaign. I had just thought it was going to be we're we're doing some fundraising, and so well, I'm going to approach it as if we're just talking about some money and we're going to be doing some fundraising. It's turning out to be a much much more personal. Um, I mean, journey for me, because not only am I moving forward in faith at church, I'm having to move forward in faith in my career. I'm having to move forward in faith with my family, with, with all of these things. And, and I, it has been a tremendous learning experience and growing experience for me. Um, and I hope it's, it's that way for you as well, as we're all gathering together to make these sacrifices to accomplish this goal, we're, whether it's $10 or $100 or $1,000, whatever it is that you're giving, I hope that you're realizing that it's not just impacting what we do at church, but it's impacting your life. Because it's impacted my life tremendously. Um, as we close this morning, I would like us to, to pray together for God to give us the seeds to plant uh, crops that we can turn around and use for his kingdom. Bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to think and talk about uh, our faith and uh, your call to um, plant seeds that we can turn around and have a harvest that uh, will not only impact our lives, but the lives of our friends, the lives of our family, the lives of our coworkers. Not today, not tomorrow, but for generations. We ask that you give us the, the seeds to, um, to plant, that you would have um, grow in the lives of these people that we interact with.